Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on economic reconciliation. My name is Susan Lowe. I'm with the Design, Coordination, and Outreach Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade, and Technology. I'm your technical support and moderator for our session today. I am located in Victoria in the beautiful traditional territories of the Lekwungen people, namely the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, before we get started, there's two ways to connect to the audio for this webinar. So if you have a headset or a microphone and speakers on your computer, you can choose the computer audio, which is the default when you log in. If you're concerned about your bandwidth or you don't have computer audio, you can select phone call instead and it'll show you dial-in information and an access code for the webinar and a pin which is unique to you and that unique pin lets me mute or unmute your line if you are wanting to speak during the webinar. Uh, the GoToWebinar platform has uh, a few different features which I'll just go through quickly. The orange arrow lets you hide that uh, control panel at the side of your screen or unhide it. It tends to hide itself automatically if you're not using it after a while. Uh, you can go full screen by clicking on the blue square uh, and the raise hands button lets you show me that you have a question to ask or you'd like to speak. Uh, we are gonna try to use raise hands on this webinar. It will be my first time managing with raise hands as a feature. So uh, please bear with me and uh, we'll try to get to everybody during the discussions. Uh, there's also the enter a question for staff. And so if you'd like to ask a question or share a comment that you want me to share on the webinar without divulging who you are, then uh, you can type it in there. I can see who you are, uh, but I can ask your question without saying your name. Um, if you're more comfortable with that. So today's objectives on the webinar, um, if you listen well and you participate, here are the learning outcomes that you're going to achieve today. Uh, you'll be able to express some of the underlying principles of economic reconciliation, uh, describe examples of economic reconciliation in action from various BC communities, and articulate actions you can take to decrease barriers and increase economic reconciliation momentum. Uh, so, without further ado, I am going to uh, introduce Paul Assert, and I will actually let him introduce himself because that is uh, so much more welcoming than me reading a bio, and Paul can tell you the story from the source. Uh, Paul. Yay. Thanks, Susan. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm assuming you can all see me, so I'm going to wave at you all from my comfortable home here in Lekwungen territory. I see there's a few people on the list that I know, so I wanted to give a few uh, shout outs to uh, Francis, Mr. Francis Bercalma, uh, and Jessica Pan, and um, Mrs. Tanya Claremont uh, so far. So uh, just uh, a special shout out to some of the wonderful people on the, on the call here that I know, and, th and thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, so uh, during the webinar, uh, I'm going to share a, a few reflections um, for about 10 minutes or so on uh, each of three topics uh, and then open the space for some um, questions and, and dialogue. And as Susan said, uh, we'll do our best to, to manage the technology here so it helps us communicate as, as best as we can. Um, and so the three aspects of uh, economic reconciliation that I'll speak to, um, uh, some of what Susan mentioned, um, is uh, the strategies to decrease barriers and increase momentum uh, towards economic reconciliation, um, some of the underlying principles of economic reconciliation and specific examples um, of reconciliation uh, in action. Um, so to get us uh, warmed up, I'll, I'll share a little bit about myself and how, um, I guess, how I show up uh, in the reconciliation space and, and more specifically in the economic reconciliation space. And uh, to do that, uh, I wanted to start in my own um, Indigenous language, which is a uh, carrier, uh, which is sort of Prince George uh, South uh, and West. Uh, so, uh, Hadi, uh, Paul Lissert, Sadni, Mark Lissert, Spa, Marilyn Lissert, Slu, 
Nasl Dea Hatsian, Sophie Keratloalu, Sagana Luxilu in Jan Yinkaktene Keo, uh, Tebe, um, Tebe Su Udzi. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. Um, uh, Snachalia in Jan Lakwangan can um, song ease in the Squamot Keo. Um, so I just uh, wanted to tell you a little bit who I am. Uh, uh, my name is Paul Lassert. My traditional name is Kilam Giloch. Um, my mom and dad is Mark and Marilyn Lassert. And uh, my grandparents from our traditional territory was Nassel Deach and Sophie Ketlow. Um, I'm a caribou clan member and I'm a mixed blood uh, carrier man. Um, and I'm a second generation residential school survivor. Um, and my uh, late wife, the, the mother of my two daughters, attended the Lajac Residential School, uh, which was uh, west of Prince George. Um, and that school closed in 1984. Um, so uh, just in terms of my sort of related uh, uh, experience at a, at a governance level, I just wanted to position myself in the conversation as well as, as it relates to um, some of the context that we'll be talking about. Um, so I, I recently completed a, a four-year term as the co-chair uh, for the board of directors for an organization called Reconciliation Canada. Um, and I shared that co-chair role with um, Sean Atlio, who uh, was uh, formerly the, the national chief. Um, during our time uh, over the last four years with Reconciliation Canada, um, economic reconciliation was a, a significant focus uh, for the organization um, and we spent a, a fair amount of time developing uh, specific training modules uh, to help facilitate the process of um, economic reconciliation for individuals, uh, companies and organizations. Um, I also just completed a, uh, a, a term of, of six years as the vice chair uh, for the Board of Directors for the Vancouver Foundation, um, which has just over uh, $1 billion uh, in their endowment. And they grant roughly $50 million a year um, to organizations, both in Metro Vancouver and, and across the province. Um, and that's also an organization um, that is on a reconciliation uh, learning journey um, and trying to chart a pathway uh, towards economic reconciliation uh, through its own capacity as an institution and more broadly through, through the philanthropic uh, sector. You see there's a couple of folks here from Friendship Centre, so I just wanted to comment briefly on, on my role um, with the, the Friendship Centre movement. Um, so for uh, a, a period of, of 20 years, um, I was the Provincial Executive Director for the BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centres with our office in Victoria here. Um, and that was from 1996 to uh, 2016. <clears throat> um, during that time, uh, we developed a, a five by five Aboriginal job strategy, um, which was designed to get uh, 5,000 Aboriginal people in BC working within five years, so to transition uh, 5,000 Indigenous people into the workforce uh, over a period of five years. Um, since retiring from the BC Association in 2016, uh, I've been leading uh, two organizations, um, the Moosehide Campaign, um, which is uh, working to end violence against women and children, and that's this uh, little patch of Moosehide here, um, and so we've been partnering with the province of British Columbia, municipal governments, companies, and so on, to, to advance that aspect of reconciliation. Um, and I am also a, a managing partner uh, with a firm called uh, Raven Capital Partners. So Raven Capital um, is an Indigenous financial intermediary that is facilitating the flow of capital to Indigenous social entrepreneurs. Um, and unlocking uh, new sources of capital for Indigenous entrepreneurs who often do not qualify for and or are not comfortable with accessing um, traditional sources of capital. 
Um, and we are also facilitating uh, renewable energy capital projects uh, in First Nations communities. And I'll talk a little bit about that as, as one of the examples. <clears throat> um, but uh, I, I just wanted to be crystal clear that I am not an expert on economic reconciliation. And I'm, I'm positive that many of you uh, on this call uh, know much more than I do about what is currently working really well uh, in this province and all the incredible innovations um, that are happening uh, in that space. So um, I, I, I'll talk about what I do know uh, about economic reconciliation, um, but, but first I wanted to uh, get Susan to uh, just advance to um, the next slide. Uh, and and I, I see from the attendees list that, that folks are, are participating from uh, various sort of uh, sectors and contexts uh, around the province. And so, um, so uh, you know, I don't want to assume that everybody knows all of the 94 TRC calls to action and or that you've memorized them. Um, and, uh, but I, I just wanted to, to say this ab about the TRC calls. Um, uh, look, we, we had, you know, seven years uh, of um, testimony and, and research and understanding about the intergenerational effects of residential schools and colonization in Canada. Um, and uh, 6,700 residential school survivors um, shared their truth uh, and in a way that was recorded um, and, and often in front of witnesses. And for many of our people, including a number of members of my own family, um, you know, folks told their story about what happened to them when they were little for the very first time. Uh, in a very painful way at, at, a, at an advanced age in their life. And so uh, it is incumbent on us um, to pay uh, very serious attention to the roadmap that was generated uh, and that is rooted in the wisdom uh, and the teachings and the learnings um, and, and the trauma uh, that uh, flowed from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so um, so this is uh, what you see now is uh, call number 57. Um, we call upon the federal, provincial, territory, and municipal governments to provide education to public servants on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law, and Aboriginal Crown relations. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, and, and there's one more that, that we'll, we'll speak to now. Um, so that was uh, uh, call 57. This is um, TRC call to action 92. And this is the, the call that's specific to the business community. Um, we call upon the corporate sector in Canada to adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as a reconciliation framework and to apply its principles, norms, and standards to corporate policy and core operational activities involving Indigenous peoples and their lands and resources. This would include, but not be limited to, the following. Commit to meaningful consultation, building respectful relationships, and obtaining the free, prior, and informed consent of Indigenous peoples before proceeding with economic development projects. Ensure that Aboriginal peoples have equitable access to jobs, training, and education opportunities in the corporate sector, and that Aboriginal communities gain long-term sustainable benefits from economic development projects. And provide education for management and staff on the history of Aboriginal peoples, similar to Call 57, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the UN DRIP, Treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law, and Aboriginal Crown relations. This will require skills based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti racism. So, those are the two calls um, uh, that are part of the, the 94 TRC uh, calls to action and, and very relevant to this discussion uh, in terms of, of you know, the question is how do we find a roadmap? for economic reconciliation. And in fact, um, it's not uh, something that we need to uh, recreate. There are certainly uh, guidelines that have been established and, and 
billions and billions of dollars and and you know tens of thousands of hours uh, and thousands of individuals uh, that have uh, participated and contributed to uh, some very specific um, calls to action. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to, to, to shift and, and, and just sort of share a little bit about uh, some of the things that I've come to understand about economic reconciliation. And the first is that uh, we cannot reverse hundreds of years of unequal relationships uh, overnight. Um, that the history of, of broken treaties, uh, territorial dispossession, uh, Indian reservations, and residential schools is going to take time. It's going to take time to overcome uh, those things. And so the, the journey of, of economic reconciliation is exactly that. It will be a journey more than a destination. And, um, and in an environment, in an economic environment that tends to be transactional, um, this may be a, a new skill set um, that is necessary uh, to build some of the things that we're looking for together, uh, shared prosperity, economic certainty, uh, you know, uh, progress around viable economic projects, et cetera. Um, and we'll need to do it uh, together um, if we're going to have a, a better future than the past that we've had. Um, but, uh, you know, I also know that we've inherited a legacy of very specific barriers to economic reconciliation um, that we are going to need to surface and then remove. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it raises uh, my first question for, for each of you uh, on the call. And I think it's perhaps the most uh, difficult and important takeaway uh, from this webinar, at least I hope it is. Um, and, and the question is this, um, you know, how are you a barrier to economic reconciliation? How are, how are each of you uh, on this call a, a barrier to economic reconciliation? How is what you think, how you act, the assumptions you carry, uh, and even um, the things that you don't know uh, creating barriers? Um, to economic reconciliation and and what can you do uh, to remove those barriers so I'm going to give you a, a minute <clears throat> to think about that um, and then I'm going to ask for uh, some of you to uh, share your thoughts and, and I'll, I'll signal to, to Susan to see if we can't find a way to to facilitate um, just a little bit of of that process um, here, um, and that and and look, the question applies to everyone on the call. So you have we have indigenous and non-indigenous people on this call, and and if you think about it in the context of of self-government, often you know it's one of the terms that people have heard for a long time and are not really clear uh, about what it means. And and my interpretation of self-government is in the literal sense in in that it's really about our ability to govern ourselves as individuals um, and and if it wasn't for people <clears throat> everything would be just great but it turns out that as as human beings um, you know uh, we have an incredible opportunity and jurisdiction to uh, condition and modify our own behavior towards uh, shared prosperity towards a shared outcome and in fact, we are probably the, the most significant variables in the space, every single one of us. Um, and so if we're gonna move towards shared economic prosperity, it's really about, in large part, our ability to remove ourselves as barriers or to surface uh, within ourselves the um, barriers in the way that we think, act, um, and, and some of the beliefs that we hold. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, turn that over to the, to the group. Um, and I don't know how to do that. So I'm gonna ask Susan to- Oh, we'll, we'll get it started. Um, there, there was a question that came up and maybe that can help people uh, generate some of their own ideas. And, and that uh, was, what do we mean when we say economic reconciliation? Is there a, is there a nutshell explanation of the term? Is it different no. for everybody? Is it contextual? 
Yeah, um, I, I want to. I want to um, keep. I want to keep the. the well, I'll get there, but I want to keep the. I want to keep the question uh, open because um, in this transactional environment, the the our tendency is to want to go to the solution, um, and and really the 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 process of economic reconciliation is more of a journey than a destination point, and so the question is a bit tricky itself in that and it's a learning opportunity in and of itself because um it 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 sometimes um i think betrays for all of us our desire to either expedite or understand um in concrete terms um what our desired future state is or what the destination point is and in fact the the pathway of economic reconciliation is really about the shared journey and and that is really what pulls folks into the complexity um, of the space that that we all run up against on a pretty consistent basis um, and make mistakes that cost us money and time it cost us economic opportunity um, because we're we may in fact be looking for the wrong thing or we may be um, making an effort to circumvent um, a learning journey within ourselves and between each other that is in fact going to help us to realize um, economic opportunities. And, and of course, some of those core principles uh, associated to economic reconciliation related to economic opportunity is the shared value space. And so we were having that conversation earlier that, that indigenous people um, often and indigenous nations and tribes often have a very holistic understanding of economic development opportunities and, and are often looking for triple bottom line um, uh, projects and that things that move the further you move away from a triple bottom line opportunity um, and and where there is uh, increased profit and decreased safety for the environment or or no collective benefit for indigenous people um, that starts to move further away from the lens of economic reconciliation and so um, as it relates to specific economic opportunities you know in the in the broader umbrella it's a very large umbrella um, and so, uh, so all of that to say, I want to pull folks away from um, the the uh, the crystallized definition, and more towards the opportunity to understand um, the journey, the process of the journey. Cool. Um, we had one comment, and it's uh, from an indigenous person who says, "I'm accustomed to being thankful for whatever is offered instead of standing up." For what is deserved. So, I'm going to I'm going to throw mine here because I know that for some people being on a webinar where they know uh, some of this is, is being recorded and it might feel uncomfortable for some people to share. I'm just going to throw in a, a risk and share uh, what I've reflected on and uh, where I think I'm a barrier. And there's two things actually. One, uh, my my education in this province taught me more about the deficiencies of Indigenous people and, and what they had suffered than about what they are capable of. Uh, so my orientation coming into this field of work is, I'm going to just say it's, it, it's a paternalistic orientation, which is that everything I've ever heard is about the challenges faced instead of uh, the opportunities of doing economic work in a different way. Uh, and my other barrier is I like to create solutions. So I want to be like, oh, let's get some quick wins. Let's get yep. some, some things on the ground. Let's do some things instead of spending the time to, uh, to go slowly and reflect on this is a shared journey. We've got generations. We've had generations. So those are the two things that um, I think have to be on my mind as I yeah. go forward. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. Uh, so, um, uh, so JP Gladu is is the many of you will know him is the um, the president and CEO for the Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business, and so it's a collective of five hundred uh, companies. Uh, and uh, about 75, 80% of them are indigenous owned um, companies. Uh, and they just completed a, a three year study in this space to sort of unpack 
the economic potential, uh, the the, uh, it, the impact on Canada's economy of, of, of um, if we do the barrier removal and unleash the economic potential of Indigenous communities. Um, and they have, um, in, including a, a group of, of economists uh, working with them through this study, have pegged it at about $27 billion wow. a year um, in Canada uh, of, um, of, of if we were producing at the same level as, in terms of our communities, the capacity of our communities as other Canadians. Um, and that uh, is just under 2% of Canada's GDP, GDP about 1.7% of Canada's GDP, um, which in the broad context is um, a material, it, it, and even in the context of British Columbia, if you just extrapolate that to, to our provincial context, 2% uh, of GDP um, in, in a provincial context is a significant, is a significant variable. And so, um, so the value proposition um, for shifting our lens, shifting that deficit lens, um, is it, it can be entirely selfish <laughs> in, 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 the, in the broader context of, of our, our shared economic prosperity. Yeah. Um, and it's not, limit, it's not limited to those things. I'll, I'll give you a few other examples, and I, and I do want to see if we can get one or two more people. We've to, got one to, person. Yeah, we've got oh, one, good. Person, okay. one more person. Okay. Um, okay. Can I share that? I'll go with that. Okay, so when it comes to being a barrier, I think we often, I'm going to do the air quotes, go to what we know. So in this context, we go to the traditional partners, so the business organizations, companies, et cetera, that we work with, perhaps unintentionally, without culturally always encompassing or including our First Nations in the discussions and the partnerships. So it's the go to what you know mentality. Sure, sure, awesome. Thank you, thank you so much for that one. Um, it's absolutely right. And look, if, if everything that we've been doing up until this point is working or was working well, then we would not be on this call and we would not be needing to have this conversation. Okay, so there, let's, let's agree also that um, some of what we've been doing in the context of economic reconciliation and economic prosperity, shared economic prosperity, and a better future than the past that we've had as Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians together, not everything has been working well. And so, you know, the, the nature of the opportunity is for us to unpack that and disentangle what it what you know go to what you know most of that has not been working for indigenous people and i would suggest that the status quo is unacceptable for all of us the status quo of the quality of life the standard of living education outcomes health outcomes violence against women those outcomes that are very often um, uh, uh, related to poverty and economic marginalization that status quo i think i hope that we can agree um is um unacceptable so yeah. so to go to go back to the question um how are things that you don't know currently creating barriers to economic reconciliation that might seem like an odd question and so i want to i want to give an example of, of what that might mean and and so take the indian act i want to take the indian act as an example so so as as i'm sure most people on the call here know we we literally have a law in Canada that only applies to Indians. We're one of the very few jurisdictions on the planet that has segregation um, still as, as a practice here in 2018. We have segregation in Canada. We have statutory segregation. Um, and we have a law for Indians and then all the other laws for all of the rest of Canadians. Okay? Yeah. And, and, I can, and I can tell you definitively uh, that the Indian Act is historically the number one driver of economic marginalization for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in Canada. So if we're going to have, like, air quotes again, economic reconciliation, um, does it not make sense that we gain at least some understanding of the main reason why we need it in the first place? And also, is it not prudent to understand what some of the specific barriers are that we're trying to address. Now, that's not to suggest that the folks on this call and or we as Canadians outside of the federal um, parliament have the ability to change statutes, but it does suggest that to, um, to dance blindly with a set of barriers that we're trying to remove is contrary to the effectiveness and efficiency that is the foundation of good business, right? Yeah. To, so so there, there, are, there are variables in the space of barriers that are we are blind to 
um, when we're trying to remove barriers and increase momentum around reconciliation. So to reframe the question, is it possible that your lack of knowledge of legislation that negatively affects the economic well-being of Indigenous people is a barrier in and of itself to economic reconciliation? And if so, what can you do to remove that barrier? And I would suggest that this question also applies equally to Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. I talk to Indigenous people all, all over the country, and I would suggest that somewhere in the range of 5% of our people um, have a detailed understanding of what's in the Indian Act. Mm. And in fact, it's a it's a statute that has had the most profound effect on our lives. It's the most influential thing in the country um, that has affected our economic and, and our broad, more general well-being. And I would suggest that the percentage of non-Indigenous Canadians is much lower. Much lower. Uh, yeah. that, that, and, that understands what's in the Indian Act. Yeah, and it's interesting um, talking with, uh, I'm going to try to not talk about other people's stories. I'll talk about my story, but when I discuss uh, economic development with people I know who are who worked in the uh, like the, the, the world of financial capital, let's say, and I, I mentioned uh, the Indian Act uh, has real, you know, has impacts on how investment capital can be used or how land ownership is recognized and how uh, First Nations can can use the land that they have to generate capital through mortgages and stuff like that. But there are restrictions on that. And, and I've talked to some people who are not aware of those restrictions. So when we move into a space of trying to partner, but we do not understand the operating context for the people we're trying to partner with, um, we set up unnecessary barriers. It's, it's like not noticing that somebody has their, you know, has their leg bleeding and, and just expecting them to run a race with you. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, yes. it would be nice if I noticed that yes. uh, you have some things that are holding you back. We've got another yes. comment from one of our attendees, which is, I think, pertinent to this, you know, not knowing. Um, I'm going to read it to you. My barriers are fear and ignorance. I do not know what changes will result from the reconciliation process. What might the future of Canadian institutions look like after reconciliation? I hear the term indigenization of Canadian culture and institutions, uh, incorporation of indigenous laws and values, and I don't know what changes this will bring. This uncertainty causes me to wonder if there might be conflicts, enforcements of changes that are not yet understood, etc. How do I learn Indigenous history and values that stem from the stories that are owned by Indigenous peoples and rightfully protected vigorously by them uh, from misappropriation by others? Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you to the person so much, uh, for, to the person that shared that question. Um, and so uh, it's, it's exactly um, in, in a, an incredible uh, level of precision the, the, the point that I'm trying to get at, which is um, that so much of the journey of towards economic reconciliation or the journey of economic reconciliation is about learning. It's about unlearning um, the intergenerational narratives that have been fed to us um, by a, a, a colonizing society. Um, uh, and, and it's part of the lens of oppression. If you look all over the world, colonizing societies feed themselves a narrative of a deficit lens of the people that they're oppressing. It's, it's massively ironic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, um, and so it really is about learning. And one fabulous uh, opportunity to learn um, is the um, Indigenous cultural competency training uh, that's offered by the Provincial Health Services Authority, the PHSA. It has a little bit of a uh, health slant on it, but it's it's um, it's wonderful. There's over 35,000 people, many in the provincial public service, um, that have taken that training. It's very inexpensive. It's $250, um, and it they say it's eight hours, but it takes about 10 hours. And for people who want to, um, you know, make some semblance of a commitment to your learning journey around reconciliation and unpacking some of those learnings, uh, it's powerful. It has um, little exercises that you can do. It has videos um, with subject matter experts on a range of Indigenous engagement uh, capacities. Um, and um, and um, yeah, so, that, so that's one good example. 
Um, and I just wanted to uh, just give, give one other example um, in the context of how we think and act um, and in part of your own journey towards economic reconciliation. And, it, and this is also speaks to the last question. Um, so uh, so there's, an, there's an old narrative in this country um, that the government takes care of the natives. And I'm going to use like really um, plain, plain folk language here, that the government takes care of the natives, that our tax dollars are already being wasted on overly generous government programs that provide a lot of free things for First Nations and for Indigenous peoples. There is, a, there is a dominant narrative, particularly in the older generation of this country, um, where that is really a, the, the general understanding. And, and, it's, and sometimes it goes as far as that, just it goes as far as that, um, that the government takes care of the natives and um, that our tax dollars are already being wasted. Um, and so, so I, you know, my, my invitation is to, for yourself, to see if that's what you think. And I'm not suggesting that, that you know, folks on this call think that, but, but is that what you think or is, is it what people you know think? And, and, I, and, and I would suggest it presents a really important opportunity in the business community to practice barrier removal towards an economic reconciliation because that narrative is a barrier. That narrative is a fundamental barrier to economic reconciliation. And the way to remove that barrier, okay, um, is to promote a new narrative, promote a narrative that's much more rooted in truth to the point that you raised earlier, Susan, um, that First Nations uh, and Indigenous people are and always have been since the early days of contact in this country, an incredible source of innovation. That the innovations that this country is founded on, you can read uh, um, John Ralston Saul of Fair Country um, is, is a great, um, it's a great read in, in unpacking um, so many of the innovations that this country is, it was rooted in um, are Indigenous innovations. John Ralston Saul, A Fair Country. Um, so part of, the, part of the new narrative, which is rooted in truth, um, is that First Nations and Indigenous people are an incredible source of innovation, always have been and are today. Um, two, that we are necessary partners in building economic certainty in the province of British Columbia. This is a new narrative from, mm -hmm. from you know, lazy and everything's free to uh, necessary partners in building economic certainty in this province, okay? And the third is that we are entrepreneurial in every sense. Indigenous culture um, has always had an incredible foundation in commerce um, and entrepreneurship. Um, and that as Indigenous people, we deserve to have the same standard of living as every other Canadian. Um, and so, and so there is, a, there is a new narrative that is emerging, particularly amongst younger people uh, in this country. And, and how, we, how we think and how we act um, in the journey of economic, towards economic reconciliation is in very large part about changing the way that um, those narratives are, de are deployed in, in this country. And you can use, if you work for government, a municipal government, a company, if you work for a municipality, a regional district, if you work for a foundation, a friendship center, um, you can use your tools. You can use your uh, newsletters, you can use your website, you can use your emails. You can put it as a header on the bottom of your email. Uh, there are so many, your social media, there are so many ways that we can ampl amplify a new narrative in this country and remove the barrier of the negative assumptions that deficit lens toward Indigenous people. Um, and, and look, I'm, I'm going to leave that, that point for now. Um, uh, you know, um, how are you a barrier to economic reconciliation? What can you do to remove those barriers? Um, but it's an interesting question for your coworkers and bosses and employees as you start to um, build your economic reconciliation action plan. Okay, it's a it's a really important question, and it's it's tough because it's it causes folks to look in the mirror um, in, instead of looking down on our people. So, yeah. Before we go, forward, gonna, I've, got, I've got two things. Um, one, an additional comment that was brought forward. Um, re question two. There's a huge educational piece and public awareness piece missing. We do not often or regularly hear about the successes that are making significant changes that provide for increased understanding and that provide the space for conceptualizing the value and the possibilities. And, and then someone wanted to know the name of that course from the Provincial Health Services Authority. 
And uh, if, you'll, yeah, if you'll say it, I'll try to put it in the chat window that goes out to everybody here. Yeah, it's it's Sanyas. I think it's S-A-N-Y-A-S, but it's it's Indigenous Cultural Competency offered by the Provincial Health Services Authority, PHSA. Health Services Authority. And is it an online course? Online course, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. That is going okay. out. All right. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. So just uh, just a few ideas in terms of increasing momentum uh, towards economic reconciliation. Uh, and I want to offer a few concrete ideas. Uh, the first: um, conduct policy research and develop an econ uh, economic reconciliation policy framework for your organization or your unit. These these journeys that we're on are really important, but it's critical that we anchor them. Uh, in policy. Policy lives past your time in the job that you're in um, and this is a long-term journey so uh, policy development is really critical related to economic reconciliation uh, and it's this is something that does not have to be super long and complicated um, but it is important that part of that process is that it become mandated by your board uh, through a motion or by your senior decision maker uh, if you're in government. So find opportunities to give expression to economic reconciliation policy frameworks um, in your workplace. Um, second is uh, set targets for hiring Indigenous people. Ask yourself if the place that you work has targets. Um, and there are uh, obviously two schools of thought uh, in what is uh, seen to be um, uh, you know, uh, disadvantageous for non-Indigenous people. Um, we are well established in the human rights context and in, in, the, in the Supreme Court context um, that this is a good idea. Um, if you report to an elected body, um, then set targets for Indigenous board members. Uh, hold yourself accountable to achieving your targets for Indigenous reconciliation by including it in your audit. Um, I uh, was uh, I'm partnered with uh, Ban City Credit Union. It's one of the corporations in this province that has um, uh, had um, their auditor audit their reconciliation targets. They set reconciliation targets as a company each year, um, and then their auditor um, engages um, surveys with their employees um, and with their partners and provides them with a, a scorecard, um, A to A grade, a grade to failing grade, um, on meeting their targets that they set for economic reconciliation as a company. Um, and so uh, my reference to you in this as, as, a, as an example of economic reconciliation in practice um, is to look at their annual report, Van City Credit Union annual report this year, um, which lists some of the targets that they've set for economic reconciliation as a good example in the corporate sense. Um, include a component on reconciliation uh, in your orientation and training process for new employees. Make it mandatory. So the last question was, um, there are very few sources of um, uh, information about Indigenous history, Indigenous peoples, something to replace the old broken narrative that is the deficit lens. Um, and one of the things that happens in government uh, at all levels um, and, and in corporations is turnover. Um, so you have a constant flow of people into different positions. And one of the, um, in my opinion, one of the most powerful opportunities to build that new narrative um, and, and, and have a base of understanding with which to engage in successful economic development with Indigenous people is through orientation and training for new employees. Um, that's mandatory. Um, learn about and follow Indigenous protocols. Um, simple things like acknowledging the traditional territory at the beginning of meetings, whether you're the chairperson or just the participant, um, something that's simple, you see it happening more and more. Um, and and I, I, I add to that, I would suggest learning five words from the local Indigenous language where you live. Um, and just that journey alone is a very powerful one for individuals. It's uncomfortable and that's what we want to do. We want to get out of our comfort zones because our comfort zones are reinforcing uh, the position that we're in and use use those words respectfully when you introduce yourself at the beginning of the meeting. Put up a sign in the front of your office that acknowledges the traditional Indigenous territory you are on. Um, this is becoming common and and but it's it's simple and powerful. When meeting with an Indigenous elder or community leader, bring a small gift. A small meaningful gift is a sign of respect and it says you are there in a good way. 
Um, support your staff to volunteer for Indigenous nonprofit organizations, or you yourself um, uh, seek an opportunity to volunteer for Indigenous uh, nonprofit organizations. If you or, or your organization have an asset base, consider it through a lens of reconciliation. Can you leverage your assets for shared benefit with Indigenous people? Uh, if you have an asset base that has taken a long time to, um, to grow, uh, ask yourself if all of the assets in your asset base have been acquired ethically. And uh, this is a challenge, uh, particularly in the philanthropic sector, uh, where you have large endowments that have grown over time in the health sector for health foundations and hospital foundations and, and so on. Um, how is it that you have acquired these assets? Um, and is there an opportunity to repatriate some of those assets um, to Indigenous communities? Um, uh, and it's a very challenging question, but it's, it's one that I wanted to put to you to think about um, in your context. Set small procurement targets to purchase goods and services from Indigenous social enterprise. This is, this is a pure economic reconciliation action in practice. Okay? Set procurement targets to purchase goods and services from Indigenous social enterprises. My challenge is the two by two. Set yourself a 2% procurement target within two years. Set a goal of 2% of all the goods and services that you and your organization purchase within two years. If the business community and the government set a 2% Indigenous procurement target and we achieve that within two years, we would vastly outstrip the, the supply, the capacity of Indigenous communities to supply goods and services. Um, and we would create an economic boom amongst Indigenous entrepreneurs because the demand side would create um, a, 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 a massive market for the innovators in our communities that really don't have access to markets because of barriers like procurement policies that forget that our communities have goods and services um, and young innovators um, that are ready, willing, and able. Um, and uh, my reference uh, for procurement targets is to visit by social. And so it's led by a guy named David LePage. Um, and they've done a ton of work on supporting uh, specific institutions who are looking to move in that direction. So it's policy support and governance support um, and, and um, uh, portfolios of Indigenous um, uh, and social enterprises that have goods and services that might be aligned with your needs. I just want to mention um, as, a, as, a, as a pitch for the uh, Indigenous Business Investment Council, they maintain Indigenous business listings. So if you go to BCIB, ic.ca you can access those business listings and just get a sense of what is on offer and that is pretty much straight that's that's economics 101 that is supply yep. and demand folks <laughs> yep yep so okay. and so you know, you know some some of some of the opportunities are that simple and immediate in front of us and but so many of them are relational right and so you know that the 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 trc the 94 calls to action is really about a reconciliation journey um, and it you know it's it's a it's a pathway it's a roadmap it's a bumpy road but it's a roadmap um, and so um, uh, and so in, in order to be able to help that process uh, I would suggest there's another training um, that you can take uh, and it's provided by uh, Reconciliation Canada and, and I, I, as I mentioned earlier I had the privilege of of being the co-chair uh, for the last four years for Reconciliation Canada um, and um, and it was, of course, founded by, by uh, Chief Dr. Robert Joseph, who's uh, just recently received the Order of Canada. Um, and and uh, you and your organization and or your family can participate in training provided by Reconciliation Canada that is specific to the economic space. Um, that's facilitative. Uh, if it is something that um, where you're looking for a facilitative organization to help um, you in your process of journeying towards economic reconciliation and you want to make a small investment um, for to pay for uh, that service, um, then Reconciliation Canada, and you can look them up, it's just reconciliationcanada.ca. Great. I just want to mention also on the per procurement part, uh, we've got a comment that came in, being part of Abro Aboriginal Business Match, uh, now Advanced Business Match, is another opportunity that municipalities and companies, et cetera, can participate in. Um, so there's uh, Aboriginal business match in various parts of the province throughout the year. Um, 
and throw it BC. So that is an opportunity to advance the procurement. Absolutely. Okay. No, Aboriginal <laughs> business practice. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot to, to mention Aboriginal Medicine of that. Thank you for the, the, that comment. Um, uh, and last, and, and I, I, I can't participate in any meeting or any conversation without um, inviting folks to join the Musai campaign. Um, you know, the, the reconciliation and umbrella is broad um, and um, we will never be, we will never achieve reconciliation and or economic reconciliation if the well-being of Indigenous women and children is not at the center of our work towards shared prosperity. The effect of uh, poverty, um, uh, large-scale resource extraction, um, the burden is borne by Indigenous women um, and our territories, and and of course, um, and and of course, Indigenous children. And you look at some of the outcomes that is the legacy of of residential schools, colonization, and the Indian Act. Um, in the form of current child welfare policies. And I'm not trying to pull the conversation into the social space. I'm suggesting that these are, you look through the one keyhole of reconciliation and you'll see our economy, but you'll also see the echo of the residential schools with the withdrawal of our children from our, our families and the marginalization and harm that's done to Indigenous women um, in this space. And um, their well-being uh, needs to be at the center of um, the work that we're undertaking moving forward towards economic reconciliation. The Moosehead campaign um, is a very simple strategy of engaging men and boys um, to wear a patch of Moosehead uh, to cause you to have conversations on a daily basis um, and to, you know, help facilitate your own journey. This space is also tends to be a little bit more male oriented. Um, and so there's lots of work that us as men in the economic reconciliation space can do in our own journey. Um, to understand the way that we need to change our behavior and the way that we need to change the deficit lens that we have towards Indigenous women and shift it towards love and respect. Um, and if that was all we achieved, um, that would be a, a, a very powerful step in the right direction. Um, to, and I can, I can promise you that they're, that they're very, very uh, closely in kin uh, with each other, um, uh, re economic reconciliation, the well-being of Indigenous women. Yeah, I think it's the, when we look at uh, why we want to grow an economy, why we want a healthy economy, and it, it is not just because we're keeping score by the numbers or by the dollars. We're doing all of these things so that people here in British Columbia can have a healthy life where they can thrive. Uh, that is the goal that the economy is in service of. So if we are neglecting the health of our communities and the people in our communities while chasing economic goals, we're kind of missing the point. Yes, 100%, 100%. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. Um, and, and so look, I, I wanted to give uh, uh, some concrete examples uh, of economic reconciliation. Actually, we've talked a, a, a little bit about them. Um, and um, and uh, you know, this is, this is where uh, many of you will have much more knowledge than, than I do uh, about uh, the brilliant things that are already happening in in every corner of this province, and so I want to I want to um, you know suggest that that a very important part of the learning opportunity uh, in this space is really to uh, watch and listen um, and find those sources that have been suggested here um, about um, you know the the innovations that are emerging now. I think out of necessity and 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 just out of the special time that we find ourselves in in this country that there's we're in, we're in a, a social and cultural transformation uh and we are in a journey of reconciliation and it's happening uh in every sector including the economic uh development sector um so the first thing i'd like to, to focus on uh is the opportunity to mobilize uh private capital uh as and and you sort of alluded to that uh, uh susan in, in 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 new ways uh okay to to enable um, triple bottom line uh, results uh, when working with uh, Indigenous people and uh, First Nations communities. Um, and, and I want to uh, suggest that, um, uh, you know, this idea of, of uh, you know, economic opportunities and economic development that achieves uh, triple bottom line uh, is a perfect example of um, recon economic reconciliation. If there was if, if you had to boil it down to a purely economic definition, uh, um, uh, economic development that achieves uh, triple bottom line uh, results. Um, 
in in and of itself uh, is is very close. Uh, but I would argue that um, economic reconciliation uh, could be a quadruple bottom line. That that in that economic development sphere, um, the idea that we measure um, you know uh, financial benefit, social benefit, environmental benefit, and benefit in the reconciliation space as a fourth um, bottom line, as a fourth aspect of the bottom line, because you can have uh, a triple bottom line, um, uh, you know, economic opportunity um, that has absolutely nothing to do with reconciliation with Indigenous people. And of course, everybody talks about Great Bear Rainforest, so I'm not going to talk about Great, Great, Great Bear Rainforest, uh, but if you don't know anything about Great Bear Rainforest, um, then check it out, because it's the Silicon Valley of of quadruple bottom line um, uh, um, results uh, in, in the economic reconciliation space. Um, so I did want to give uh, one example uh, here. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's really to address this issue that the, the lack of access to capital uh, is a crippling reality for uh, many Indigenous entrepreneurs um, and First Nations communities. And that's access to capital for everything. Some of that is statutory driven, the, the, the lack of uh, equitable funding for children in care, the lack of, of uh, equitable funding. And I don't mean like special treatment, I mean um, the funding caps that have been on uh, federal provincial transfers for things like schools for our elementary children that happen to go to school in our own communities who don't want to go or, or can't go um, to an external school, um, the cap on funding uh, for Indigenous uh, children in care, the, the cap on funding for post-secondary education and so on. So, um, so there's, there is that statutory driven lack, lack of access to capital. There's a driver, of course, um, that folks here will be familiar with around a lack of access to capital due to a lack of, of um, collateral and, and a lack of uh, leverageable assets, i.e. on reserve Generally, you can't uh, build equity in your home and or, I mean, there, there are opportunities too now, but um, generally it's been a historical barrier to raising capital on reserve for the purposes of business is that uh, folks cannot um, access the uh, build and or access equity in their home. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there are solutions to, to many of our uh, existing challenges, but we're struggling to access the financial resources to implement those solutions at scale. And that also really applies to, to many of our, our individual entrepreneurs. Uh, every good economy is based on small business. This is the success of small business. And, and the in Indigenous small business community is, is exploding. Um, and many of our entrepreneurs, their extended family, um, does not have the means to provide security for commercial debt. Um, and uh, as individuals, um, we have not inherited the capacity from our parents. Intergenerational wealth transfer is not an Indigenous phenomenon, it's a non-Indigenous phenomenon. Um, and so for those of us whose parents went to residential schools, um, you know, they, we are often uh, not uh, inheriting and or uh, provided with the security that we need as entrepreneurs uh, to be able to start and or scale a small business. Um, and so that lack of, of collateral and the lack of extended family um, security uh, is a very serious barrier and a very real limit in the flow of capital um, into the Indigenous uh, small business uh, world. So I, I believe and, and suggest that social finance uh, offers one pathway to increase uh, that flow of capital. Um, and so I mentioned I'm a, a managing partner with, with Raven Capital Partners. Um, and one of our own uh, economic reconciliation projects is to facilitate uh, geothermal or geoexchange installations uh, in First Nations communities um, and have the capital installation be funded by private investors. Um, and so there are new uh, social financing tools um, and um, opportunities on, on that part of the, of the uh, uh, investment continuum. Um, that uh, that I wanted to unpack, uh, and and one of them is is um, a, like sort of pay pay for performance uh, contracts, um, and in this context, uh, it's called um, an outcomes contract. Um, and so the project that we're we're undertaking um, is to um, have uh, private investors uh, pay the capital installation 
costs for uh, 125 uh, geothermal um, units to be installed on a per home basis in three different First Nations uh, communities. And so why would private investors want to pay for capital uh, installations um, in First Nations communities? So the role that Raven Capital Partners is playing is as, a, as a, an Indigenous financial in intermediary to unlock private capital, um, to prove to uh, governments, to prove to the federal and provincial governments um, that um, you know, we can generate long-term savings, um, and then to create social finance arrangements where um, federal and provincial governments and or municipal governments, depending on what areas of jurisdiction you're dealing with, um, uh, then backstop and or guarantee those private invest investments um, based on projected savings. And so in this instance, um, uh, with the 125 homes that we're making uh, geo exchange installations for, uh, let's say we're projecting a 50% reduction um, in kilowatt hour uh, use uh, of, of electricity uh, in those homes for the purposes of heating. Um, and so uh, the private investors um, pay the upfront costs um, in, in, and in this project, it's $5 million, so small money. Um, and the federal government uh, provides a guarantee against a very specific um, target uh, in terms of a reduction in energy uh, usage in those 125 homes. Uh, we're in construction now um, in uh, those three First Nations communities. Um, and our proof uh, in this outcomes contract is only 12 months. And so you want to, in this, in, in the case of, of uh, renewable energy, you really need one, ex one experience with each of the four seasons uh, that, that's relevant to energy consumption um, to have a sense about what your performance is going to be over the course of a year in whether or not you meet your energy reduction targets. And these are uh, fairly reliable. Uh, uh, targets that we've set based on um, similar installations in other First Nations communities. Um, after 12 months in this model, this, this social finance model called, called outcomes contract, after 12 months, the federal government uh, pays back those private investors uh, plus 5% uh, per year um, incentive payment or return on their investment. Um, they, it takes about 10 years for the federal government to have a return on their own capital investment, i.e. to pay um, or recover the capital costs um, for the, the cost of the installation, the cost of the, the, um, the capital that the geo exchange uh, tech to be put in the ground uh, for each of the homes. It takes about 10 years for them to recover their, um, their investment. And then the life cycle of the equipment is 30 years. And so, uh, amortized over 30 years, the federal government will realize uh, 20 years of, of cost saving, um, but never having had to put up a single dollar at the front end until, um, until those savings are proved. And so really they're just putting up a, a, a guarantee against the private investment um, that is like a social impact bond, but it's but it's a, a like more like a it's not a bond exactly. It's an outcomes contract, um, and uh, and so the payment gets triggered after the first twelve months uh, when all of those proofs are complete, um, and you know everybody wants to understand um, in a very accountable way risks um, and and uh, sort of empirical data as it really as as it relates to. Um, to uh, measures, metrics, the metrics associated to the project. So we have a, a principal investigator from a university um, that is providing third-party validation of the uh, installation cost, the development cost, the installation costs, um, the maintenance costs, and, and the savings. Um, and in that context, it's really just a proof of concept so that we can get a broader backstop. Um, and so our objective is sort of more than $100 million range so that we can start to raise real capital from investors who want to be part of the economic reconciliation space, who want to have that quadruple bottom line where you have environmental benefit by reduce, reducing our GHG 
uh, footprint in those communities and reducing diesel um, uh, consumption. Just in British Columbia alone, there are 80 diesel dependent communities, not all of them indigenous. Um, uh, so lots of small settlements, non-indigenous settlements as well that are diesel dependent, just in British Columbia alone, 80. Um, and so very dirty uh, source of energy. So, re so having a, a positive environmental impact, having an incredibly positive social impact. Um, and we're in the process now of measuring sort of variables around job creation and pride uh, increased health outcomes um, in communities where um, where they're participating in, in these particular projects. Um, and of course, fiscal outcomes um, in reducing uh, the cost of energy, increasing um, energy uh, sovereignty uh, in those First, First Nations communities, and facilitating economic reconciliation by having a different relationship um, between uh, government, private investors, um, indigenous communities and researchers. Uh, and if you think about all the triggers that come into your mind about the history of all of those relationships, finding opportunities um, for quadruple bottom line, um, specific targeted projects um, that um, center indigenous people and indigenous voice and center indigenous culture as environmental stewards, um, you know, there, there, is, uh, there are a litany of opportunities um, in, in aquaculture and in, in tech, in ecotourism, you know, you, you, there, you know, you don't have to look far to see the brilliance that's emerging in indigenous communities as it relates to those kind of opportunities. So, um, so I'll stop there um, and, and see, I hope that was helpful just to give you a sense about how all those things, if you practice all of those, you know, those journeys of self-discovery, um, you know, you can enable yourself, whether you're coming as a private investor or government, as a regulator um, and or as an indigenous person come into that space, shed some of the assumptions that we have about each other um, and um, and embrace the innovation opportunity. Um, there's nothing that can stop us. I think what I like about the example you provided actually is it is involving uh, private capital, but as well it's involving the federal government in a different way in the relationship with the indigenous communities where these installations are going in. This is a this is a partnering. This is a we're all going to take this on together to create benefit rather than we're going to we're going to regulate, we're going to restrict, we're going to stop um, which isn't necessarily done with a uh, a negative intention, but the the history of the relationship has been so challenging that to create a project that uh, begins showing new pathways for that relationship is is more powerful than just geothermal energy. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Um, well, we have a, a few more minutes in the webinar, and uh, people haven't asked any questions on this. Uh, I think they're all thinking really, really hard, which is a good thing. Uh, if anyone wants to. Uh, pop any questions into that question box before we go. I'll go through some of my my final webinar announcements and then if anything comes up while I'm doing that, that we can ask them. Uh, but I promise to let everyone go at 1.15 and I'm sure people have their lunches in the microwave and they're just ready to hit the go button. Uh, so um, I, first I just want to say thank you so much. This has been fascinating and uh, um, oh, here we go. We have some thank yous coming in. How valuable the webinar was, and thank you for uh, the opportunity and, and joining us. And uh, yeah, I'm going to just talk about some of the next things coming up while I still have you. We've got two webinars coming up. Uh, June 19th, we're doing the Tech Dev 101. We're looking at the innovation ecosystem model, and there's the link to go to to register for that one. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the month, we'll be doing a showcase of some of our BC Ideas success stories, and these ones will focus on workforce development initiatives. Uh, so some in really interesting projects. I'm still busy curating what those will be. So. Uh, you can register and it'll be a surprise what we talk about. <laughs> I'll be announcing it in the next couple of days, hopefully. Uh, if you're not getting the invitations to our economic development series webinars, this is the link to go to if you want to sign up to be on our invitation list. Uh, a couple people who have signed up lately accidentally weren't getting the invites. The technical problem has been identified and the solution is on the way. <laughs> um, I'm going on a road trip again. Uh, I'm going to the BC Economic Development Association Summit next week. Uh, 
this is what you could do. We're running the Wavemakers Workshop, which is a, it's kind of like speed dating for economic development resources. And uh, that's, our workshop will be on the afternoon of June 12th. So come and see us there. You now know what I look like. So come and say hi. I won't know what you look like. Uh, yeah, uh, we had one question come up. Here we go. I knew if I just talked a bit, then it would come up. Uh, your triple bottom line example is well appreciated. What opportunities do you see for new enterprises to be formed? That's for you, Paul. <laughs> Uh, what opportunities do I see for new enterprises to be formed? Um, so, uh, so I'll be a, a little bit shameless here. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the services that that um, uh, I mean, and look, contact your Aboriginal financial institution. The, the AFIs in this province are are fantastic and offer um, good uh, business development supports. Uh, get a hold of Susan and, and folks like uh, Megan at, um, at JTT um, and uh, Megan Wanuck um, and uh, you know they have uh, excellent training opportunities. Um, uh, one of the uh, supports that, that Raven Capital Partners uh, provides um, is uh, for training for um, new Indigenous entrepreneurs um, and and we try to do two things. One is, and it's two day sessions. So one is to, to, to surface indigenous entrepreneurs um, within a 200 mile radius and facilitate local networking uh, between indigenous entrepreneurs, um, both for shared learning um, and mentorship, but also to buy and sell goods and services to each other. Um, and then to provide uh, training support. And if you're loan ready to uh, make capital available to you if you're looking to scale your business, uh, your small business. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, yeah, so you can um, get a hold of, of uh, me if there, if there, you have an interest. We have training sessions coming up on Vancouver Island. And so um, uh, we can uh, make that information available, available to you as well. Great. Um, and a final question. First of all, congrats, Grand Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and with the number of Indigenous communities that are located in rural areas, are you aware of any funding or investment opportunities that are specifically available for young Indigenous entrepreneurs who are wanting to create business within their remote and rural communities? you got like two minutes before this thing ends. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, revenue opportunities for young Indigenous entrepreneurs in rural communities that are uh, trying to start a business. Uh, yeah, yeah. In those remote, remote and rural opportunity communities, yeah, for yeah, yeah, investment opportunities. Yeah, yeah. So much, you know. It, it's really about thinking differently uh, in the finance context, and and so much uh, um, opportunity exists uh, with individual indigenous governments who are innovating in that space to support their own, own local uh, indigenous entrepreneurs. Uh, and so I would start with your own indigenous government with a business plan and or support um, to uh, develop a robust business plan um, to test your market assumptions um, and to uh, and through the development of that business plan, um, you know, seek sort of explore uh, what your what your uh, capital uh, source opportunities are. But but um, but starting with, of course, you know, your own community support uh, in the development of a robust business plan is really key. Yeah, I'm just going to throw in, I'm aware of if you're on the coast, there's Coast Funds, which invests in uh, Indigenous entrepreneurs and uh, has a lot on the Coast Funds, I think it's coastfunds.ca, has a lot of stories of uh, Indigenous businesses that they've supported with fairly significant amounts of capital. And then uh, for starting up businesses, uh, I can't say enough about the community futures offices uh, and yeah. the, the resources that the people in those offices provide to entrepreneurs. They they are, are great coaches, advisors, and connectors. So uh, we don't have any more time. So I'll just say, please complete the feedback survey. Um, I'm just having this sudden moment of I may have forgotten to set up the feedback survey on this webinar. So it'll get sent to you in your email very soon if it hasn't been set up already. Uh, if, it, if it doesn't pop up when you leave the webinar, stay tuned. And don't forget to, to register for the next one. Um,
that's it. I'm going to say hi to Paul for joining us and um, that's great conversation. Thank you. And thank you everybody for taking your lunch hour to spend with us. So I'm going to Thanks, end everyone. the webinar. It'll, it'll, it's just, it's all going to shut down now. It'll be very abrupt. So uh, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Susan. Bye-bye.